Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, this paper is co-authored with Jose Alejandro Perez Cajillas and um, Hillel Seufer. And um, we have also been part of the special issue on the tax date by um, Kunal and, and Antonio. And so what um, I'm going to do today is to talk about information capacity and its relationship to the tax state. And here, I mean, when we think about um, <coughs> fiscal capacity of state of taxation, it, there is a large literature that treats taxation, um, fiscal capacity, as the very foundation of the state. So the ability of the state to mobilize resources to extract revenues from society is the basis for pretty much everything else in this perspective. So states require resources in order to exercise control and to pursue their projects. And this has led to some of the cross-national literature to also treat tax per capita or income tax per capita. It's a common measure of overall state strength. Well, one issue here with this perspective on the state is that taxation is often a matter of policy decision. And second, as we have heard from Leander, um, state capacity is not necessarily limited to fiscal capacity. State time, there's also large literature that reminds us that we should look at state capacity as something multidimensional. And that's um, our starting point. So let me drill a little bit deeper here. So when we look at um, established explanation of why do some states have fiscal capacity, why are they able to tax effectively and others don't. I mean, at this conference, I've attended fascinating panels on the role of conflict and especially civil conflict in, yeah, in shaping the capacity to tax, but also the role of, of natural resources, yeah, so mining activities. Um, <coughs> so there is a large literature on these questions, and, but when you look at the, the classical theoretical arguments around the creation of, of tax dates, there's one um, that focus, that's the perspective advanced by Charles Tillies and others that focuses on the role of external threats, broadly defined, as um, a motivator, as an engine um, for the creation of, of, of fiscal capacity. So basically, yeah, this war uh, makes states and states make war. Yeah, this, this kind of quit by Chuck Tilly. And then there is another perspective um, yeah, advanced by Margaret Levy, Levy and, and Olson um, on, the so yeah, on the famous stationary states as stationary bandits. Yeah, so there is sort of the, the main motive here is self enrichments. Um, rulers invest in the capacity to tax, to move yeah, from sort of taxing production to taxing people and their wealth. And this is kind of like a more sustained way to, to generate. Um, Income. In any case, what connects these two perspectives on the states is that they focus on the motives of tax state creation. But what we are doing in this paper, and that's a second motivation for us, is to look at, yeah, the sort of not just at the motives, but also at the like when are states or when are rulers capable of engaging in taxation. And this brings me to the recent informational turn in the study of the state. And so there's a growing literature um, across the social sciences that, yeah, starting from the idea that, that states, state capacity is multidimensional, puts the spotlight on the ability of, tac of states to gather and systematically analyze information about their subject population. Think here about the population census, 
the creation of statistical offices, land cadastres, and so on. And this perspective goes back to James Scott yeah, and his emphasis on making society on the idea of legibility. So making societies legible is a very central aspect of state development. And the one um, scholar who has put this most succinctly is Melissa Lee, who recently suggested states that cannot gather accurate information about their populations are likely to do little else effectively. And Okay, so then let's think this through, and that's the main contribution of the paper is, okay, so if states, if sort of the foundation is information capacity, how does it relate to tax capacity? And our main claim that we advance is that um, information capacity facilitates tax capacity, and I get to the theoretical part um, of the argument in a second, um, just to foreshadow um, the way in which we approach this is um, by a mixed methods approach. So we link sort of a global statistical analysis that looks at associations between measures of information capacity and fiscal capacity um, with um, historical case studies of Argentina and Chile that allow us to flesh out some of the the mechanisms that we think are underpinning this relationship. Okay, so the main argument we, we advance is that information capacity facilitates tax capacity. Um, so rulers in this perspective need to have accurate information about the basic characteristics, wealth and whereabouts of the subject populations in order to tax effectively. But how does this work exactly? This, and here we draw on, yeah, broadly on the, the idea of economies of scope. So, um, <coughs> and one um, more specific mechanism is the reuse of population. So once a state is able to um, collect yeah, information, to administer a population, census to um, have accurate information on um, yeah, land holdings of their and properties of their populations. They can reuse this information from, from population censuses for taxation, for military conscription, for the provision of health services or for reminding you about the driving license and the, the, uh, 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 the reaching the driving age um, of family members. Yeah? So the, the you can reuse information, this basic information for multiple purposes, and that yeah, creates um, efficiency gains. And the second mechanism is, is what we call the repurposing of the informational apparatus. So once you have state agents that are trained in the collection of information, yeah, you, can, you can use them also again for, for other purposes and you can, you can move them around to, yeah, from the statistics office to the tax agency and so on. And we, we observed this, for example, in, in 19th um, century Chile, that you have these career moves of people who initially started out in the statistical office. Okay, so our argument is information capacity facilitates um, state capacity, and not so much the other way around. Of course, the first, I mean, I'm talking to a lot of economists here, so reverse causality. Well, let me just say um, two things on this. First, um, um, like, and that's largely historical, again, based on our case studies, is that um, what we observe is that um, usually you can, you c of course you need some resources, but you can, s um, usually these, um, the formation of static information capacity requires only very relatively small number of, 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 of agents. And it's, and it's often also 
that the state appropriates um, information gathering capacity from other non-state actors. In the case of Chile, this was the Catholic Church and its, its um, church registers and so on. And so it's rather non-costly. And so what I'm saying is essentially these were rather small enterprises that require very or comparatively little resources yeah, as an argument against that it might also be the other way around. Anyway, we get to that in the case studies, so let me first walk you through the, the quantitative part of, it, of our analysis. We um, measure information capacity by the so-called state capacity scores um, collected by Melissa Lee and Zhang, and here this measures this measure measures legibility of citizens by looking at the quality of population censuses. Like whether the age distribution in a population censuses follows a smooth curve or whether you have the clustering around certain ages, like zero and five. And this clustering, yeah, which is called age heaping, is indicative of limited information capacity because either citizens don't have birth certificates, don't know their exact age, then the, the person conducting the, um, the um, population census is, yeah, takes a wild guess. It's usually with a zero, yeah, an age with a zero or a five at the end. Or there are inherent problems or constraints within yeah, the, the informational apparatus yeah, that agents just don't interview or consult with, with citizens, but rather make the numbers up. And it's very hard to make numbers up in a consistent way, so you usually also have this kind of clustering effects. Either way, so this, this is a, it's, it's a measure of the quality of the population censuses. We check, we do robustness checks with other measures of information capacity. There's an, an, an kind of the so-called information capacity index that looks at the presence of a statistical office, the regular administration of population censuses, um, the presence of a um, registry, and so on. So this is like a more, um, more abs um, um, how do you say? Anyway, it's, it's another way to looking at um, information capacity. Fiscal capacity, well, the UNU wider government revenue data set, and we look at different kinds of taxes, the main one being direct taxes on income, land, personal, property, profits, and capital gains, because that's really like where you, the, the, it's the direct effort of states to collect revenues from, from individuals. Indirect taxes such as VAT, we also look at this, probably needs somewhat less yeah, um, fiscal capacity. But then we also cross-check for total tax revenues and resource revenues, which we do not uh, expect to be positively asso or associated with information capacity. Income, income taxes we controlled for, but the problem is that in much, like in the global sample, we are looking at, looking at personal income tax um, made only a very, very small part of the overall tax revenue gathered by um, um, by states. Okay, so here you have the the um, the table with our results, and yeah, sort of in the first column you have we just run the main measure of interest, legibility, and then with we run the same again with a number of relevant controls, and the results are broadly in sync with our expectations. There's a positive association between legibility and direct taxes, but also total tax, indirect taxes. Um, <coughs> there's a negative association between legibility and total resource revenue, sort of the taxes that come from natural resources. And also interesting, yeah, personal income tax. There is, I mean, it, the, the coefficient is in the expected direction, but ultimately it doesn't turn out statistically significant. Again, sort of the small here, yeah, to, to highlight the small 
percentage of personal income tax um, in, in much of the developing world. Okay, so broadly, wow, I've been going slow. Okay, so let's be, how much do I have? Three. Three, okay. Thank you, Leander, for, um, for speeding up. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so the case study, I, I just walk you through very quickly through one of the case studies. And, and this is, is, is Chile, there's also Argentina in the paper. And um, one argument the case study makes is, um, <clears throat> so already before the nitrate commodity boom in the 1980s, uh, sorry, in the 1880s, and before the war of the Pacific, Chile was one of the most developed tech states in Latin America. So this goes against this, Bellicist approach that tax that wars make tax states and and so on and also um, <coughs> um, yeah sheds light on on that the nitrate commodity boom was not was not an engine of the creation of the tax states so you have this incre steady increase from the 1840s um, onwards and <coughs> here we sort of to, to look at this trend yeah, from the 1840s until the 1880s. Um, <coughs> sort of what's the association here between um, sort of two information capacity? And so, yeah, you have a, st um, what we find is that a statistics office has been established. The census taking quality has, has improved in this period. There are regular statistical yearbooks published. Um, <coughs> So really like systematic state record keeping on a variety of economic um, activities and demographics um, characteristics of the population takes off during this um, time period. And, <coughs> and in that, in that um, period we also find um, that it, the introduction of a land cadaster came before yeah, the introduction of property tax collection. So, land cadaster preceded, yeah, um, prop, yeah, the introduction of of property tax collection and its implementation. Um, and then also another indication for this link between information capacity and fiscal capacity is that many of the taxes were eliminated, of the direct taxes were eliminated during the nitrate boom. In the in the late 19th century, but once the nitrate boom stopped, and um, other like uh, sources for fertilizers were discovered, that so the nitrate didn't have to be exported from Chile to Europe anymore. Um, this capacity to collect information continued, and it be, and very quickly the Chilean state then returned to um, various forms of direct taxation in the early 20th century. Okay, so um, do I still have 30 seconds? Yes. So, um, <coughs> so what this study brings in is, is information capacity as an underappreciated factor into the study of um, fiscal capacity. Um, cautions against just using fiscal capacity as a shorthand for overall state strength. Maybe in terms of policy implications, two things that I, I'm happy to elaborate on. One is this cautions, our research cautions against the privatization of information gathering that happens in many countries in the moment, for example in Sweden, that the state outsources yeah, basic information collection, census taking to private companies. From what we have study, this might not be such a great idea. Also, we're engaging in debates around the creation of pockets of ef effectiveness yeah, that often focus on strengthen the, the, um, yeah, the bureaucratic competence of the tax agency in countries. Sure, but you see the linkages yeah, and the interlinkages to information capacity. So what we advocate is not just focused on the tax agency as a pocket of efficiency, but also take yeah um, a more multi-dimensional focus on other um, yeah state offices such as yeah the st um, statistics office, which is very important. Anyway, I leave it at that. Thank you very much.